people that have been really excited about Heart Month this year. Um, obviously, uh, patient people on campus, but a lot of folks from marketing, um, folks from HR, just a lot of people are interested in our own health. And so, you know, the purpose of this, and I, I put this title yesterday, Taking Care of Ourselves, right? So everyone here, in some form or fashion, I've had the... Uh, Good fortune of meeting a lot of people walking around the room, and everyone's from a different background here and what they do at UT Southwestern, but we're all in some way or another taking care of people, right? We're all improving people's health, be it research, be it administration, be it direct patient care. Um, but we always have to remember the purpose today is how do we take care of ourselves, right? And ourselves is everybody in this room, but also our colleagues, our family members, and that's the spirit of today is to talk about how do we take care of ourselves. Um, I will say that. Um, this is being beamed live to some of the clinics outside, so there's some more people that have the opportunity to participate. And the goal here is, I do have a lecture in quotes plan, so I have slides and things to talk about, but I really hope this is interactive, and meaning you guys can ask me any question that's on your mind. We've had two heart fairs already, and what's the most fun for me, we've been doing that for about eight years, and they just get better and better, and what's great is the questions that people ask. People come up with the best questions about something that they always had a question about, about blood pressure, about cholesterol, about something they saw in the news, and they want to know what we think about it. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any question, no holes barred. You guys can ask me anything you want, okay? Uh, so I'll start and talk about some things, but and I do have a, a couple of quiz, quizzes along the way to ask you as well, okay? All right, so let me just start. I always have everyone who gives a talk about heart disease always starts with this slide. Um, it kind of gets boring after a while, but you, you couldn't say it enough times. Cardiovascular disease still is the number one cause of death in the United States. And in, on the red on this side, we have men, and over here we have women, and this is cardio, deaths from cardiovascular disease. If you add them up together, almost 800,000 people in the United States a year die from cardiovascular disease, okay? This next one, B, is cancer, okay? So if you add up all cancer, it's still not close to what we get from, or not nearly as close as what we get for cardiovascular disease. So still the number one cause of death, more than the next four leading causes combined, all right? Bless you. So even though I'll show you, we made a lot of, we've made a lot of uh, benefits, we've done a lot better, there's a long way to go. So we always like to remind people, because I wear this pin, it's the number one cause of death in women, and women all, often used to not know that, and I say that not because I think that, there were surveys done over the last decade where very few actually knew that it was the number one cause of death in women. And fortunately, people are getting that message. You know, put in perspective, 400,000 women a year die of cardiovascular disease, 80,000 a year die of breast cancer. Still a very important disease, but just to give you numbers about that. Now, we've been doing a really good job. Not we. A lot of this happened before I was born. Uh, but over society, we've done a, a great job. You know, this is death rates in the population. And things got really bad right after World War II, right? So 19... 45 or 50. Here's my quiz, but probably nobody will know this. Cardiovascular has been the number one cause of death since the 1900s, every single year except for 1919. Anybody know what that was? What caused it? The flu. She got it. There it is. So influenza pan pandemic, that was a one year that it wasn't cardiovascular disease, right? And But things about 1960s or so, we started to figure out, like, smoking's bad, blood pressure's bad, cholesterol. And so all these things that we take for granted, we actually didn't know that. Um, when Roosevelt... Uh, President Roosevelt died of a, a stroke in um, the 1940s. His blood pressure was like 250 at the time, 250. And his cardiologist, a guy named Paul Dudley White, one of the most famous cardiologists to date, still had a question of whether that was a bad thing, you know, whether his blood pressure 250 was bad. Um, so you take all, we take all that for granted, but we didn't know that back then. But after we figured it out, things have gotten a lot better and they continue to decline. So that's the good news is that we can do something about this, purpose of our talk today. Now, just a real quick thing just to prove to you or at least show you some evidence that we can actually do something to prevent heart attacks and strokes. Um, this is a study where, uh, this is a famous study by a guy named Jeremiah Stambler. He's 97 years old and still does research. Amazing guy at Northwestern. And uh, what he showed was the following. He took 270,000 men in this study and looked at those that had um, any risk factors for heart disease. So they either had high cholesterol, blood pressure wasn't perfect, were smoking, had diabetes or something, and this was their risk of having uh, death from heart attacks. And then he compared that, so people had any one of those things, compared to people where everything was perfect, blood pressure was perfect, cholesterol was perfect, didn't have diabetes, et cetera, and there was an 80% reduction in the risk of heart attacks. Same thing he did in another group of men, 80% reduction, and here's a group of women, 80% reduction. So we, we throw out this number, we can debate this, but maybe even up to an 80% lower risk by, um, by taking care of our risk factors. 
That is preventable. There's, there's some diseases we can't do a lot out. This one we absolutely can. That's what we're going to talk about today. All right. So you say, Dr. Kerr, I hear you. Um, we need to do something about it. But this is what people use. I'm just coming from clinic. This is usually what they're thinking. It goes like this. It says, give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice, right? <laughs> that, and that's what people are usually thinking. Like, well, that sounds great, but maybe in a couple years, in a couple years, in a couple years. One thing we're learning, and I don't have a slide on this, um, great work done at UT Southwestern shows that if you just do a little bit early in life, right? So if you start 20s and 30s, even just a little bit, that's probably far better than waiting to your 60, 70, and then trying to really improve things. It's almost, I don't want to say it's too late, but you get a bigger bang for your buck doing a little bit early in life, right? So early in life is important. Okay. Risk factors. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about risk factors. Today's focus is really about our risk factors, because if we can control them, then we can really lower our risk for heart attacks and strokes. Um, somebody name me a risk factor for heart disease. Anything. Smoking. Smoking. One, one of the most important ones. What else? Diabetes and bad blood sugar, atherogenic diet, bad diet, right? And we're going to talk about that because what's a bad diet, right? There's so much information you get. What else? Lack of exercise. Obesity and weight. Yep. Family history, very good. And then high blood pressure, right? I think we covered most of them. Good, very good. So if you really think about it, there's modifiable, non-modifiable. Modifiable means you can do something about it. High cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, obesity, poor diet, sedentary lifestyle. Now that may, you know, you hear this over and over and over and over again. And it might start, and the people get lulled on this. But I'm going to, you know, I showed you already. If you can work on this, potentially an 80% reduction. And today we're going to talk about some of the nuances about that. Unfortunately, things you can't do anything about, right? You can't change your family. You may want to, but you can't. Family is what it is, right? Um, we can't technically change your gender medically, and then you can't change your age. Uh, so those things we can't do anything about. Unfortunately, age is actually the number one risk factor. I always tell my patients, because they don't like me to say this, but I say, you know, your life insurance guy knows that better than I do, that your age tells you your risk for heart disease. It's, it's, not, it's not personal, you know? Um, but, so we can't do anything about these things, but these things we certainly can. And we'll walk through a few of these today and just talk about what are things I heard on the um, health fairs, what I hear people ask me, and, and then, you know, hear people's questions as well. I'm going to start with blood pressure. Uh, so in the United States, there's, what, 300-something million Americans. How many million people do you think have high blood pressure? All of them. <laughs> David thinks all of them do. What do you think, uh, 20 million, 50 million, 100 million, 1 million? What? 60 million? She's pretty close. She is pretty close. 80 million Americans. 80 million Americans. There's a big thing the HR group is doing towards blood pressure, which we're starting here at UT Southwestern for our employees. We're also doing things for our patients, but really trying to manage blood pressure. And we'll talk about why. Why focus on blood pressure? So why is it called a silent killer? Because you don't see it coming. And, and why is it? Because you don't know you have it, right? And, and you know, when we say we know you have things, usually it's because you, you feel something, right? And the one thing about hypertension is you won't feel a thing. Usually. You can if it's real bad, but often you don't feel a thing until bad things happen, right? And let's talk about some of those bad things. So one of the worst things is kidney disease. So blood pressure and diabetes are the two biggest causes of dialysis in the United States, right? So I work at CUH. I also work at Parkland. And because of the population we see at Parkland, which has a little more hypertension, every single time I'm on service there, every single time, we admit at least one to two people we start on dialysis because they had high blood pressure they didn't treat and they didn't even know. Every single time. For the last 11 years of my own faculty here. So a lot of people say, well, I didn't feel anything. And the flip side is when we start them on blood pressure medicine, they say, I didn't feel better, so I stopped. You're not going to feel better because you don't feel anything, right? So you have to know that. But blood pressure is so important cause of chronic kidney disease and dialysis, right? Um, the other part, I'm a heart doctor, so I'm going to speak about heart things. Um, heart attacks and stroke. Now, there's a couple of things that happen with high blood pressure. You get heart attacks. You also get congestive heart failure, or weakened heart over time. Um, and you can also have heart rhythm problems, something called atrial fibrillation. All of those are linked to high blood pressure. And then stroke, which we certainly don't talk about enough. You've seen UT is, has these posters up because we're a major stroke center. Here's the thing about stroke. All right. Do you think, here's a quiz number two, blood pressure, more important for heart attacks or stroke? It's because I asked the question that way, right? It's a good <laughs> question. It's a bad way to ask a question. All right, I set myself up. If you lower your blood pressure, you cut your risk of stroke by 30 to 40%. If you lower your blood pressure, you cut your risk of heart attacks by 20 to 30%. So it's important for both, but it's far more important for 
strokes, okay? I just saw a woman who uh, had a minor stroke that I've been seeing for years, late last year, and blood pressure not well controlled, and cholesterol, and she doesn't really want to treat either. And I said, if I had to pick one today, I'm going to treat your blood pressure, um, but they're both important. We end up treating both, but I just want to make sure you appreciate how important blood pressure is for strokes um, and also for heart disease. And again, you don't know you have a stroke until you have a stroke. That's the worst thing about it, right? You're fine, you're fine, you're fine. All of a sudden, you have a stroke, right? Um, and uh, so anyway, blood pressure is so important. It's very common, 80 million people, and you won't feel anything. And that's why you just need to get checked at your doctors, you know, at least once a year. And if it's high, check it again. They're all over campus. There's blood pressure ones or one at Bass. I'll show you in a second on our web link. We can find out where they are on campus. And just go check it yourself if, if, if you don't like what you're seeing in the doctor's office. But don't ignore it, whatever you do. So the things I want to talk about is just numbers, okay? Just to make sure we're on the same page. Normal is less than 120 over 80. That, that's what we should all try to get. Meaning if you're not on medicines, and if you're, you know, when, we, when, we're, when we're babies, we have blood pressures like 100. And over life, we do things that it creeps up, right? And our goal in life is to preserve that, that good blood pressure. The less than 120 over 80, and you say, well, I don't, I don't really know anybody like that. If you look at like hunter and gatherer populations that live in places where there's not a lot of McDonald's and sodium, their blood pressure is about 105. That's, that's about what it is, you know? But in our environment with the diet we eat and everything we do, that's just not what we get. Now, pre-hypertension borderline is 120 to 139. And above 140, the top number is considered hypertension. Or above 90, the bottom number is considered hypertension. The thing I want to say is this. If you're hypertensive above 140 over 90, you, you need to check it again. And if it's high, we'll talk about some lifestyle things. But if it remains high, you need to be on treatment. But we'll talk about some lifestyle things. But if your blood pressure is borderline, that's still not okay. Because what's going to happen over life, it's going to keep going up. Everyone's does. Everyone's goes up as we get older. So you have to work on bringing that down, even if you don't, quote, quote, need a medicine yet, right? And so what are some things we can do to lower our blood pressure without a pill? What are some things we can do? Exercise. Really important. Exercise is really important. What else? Eat better. So tell me, what does that mean, right? Because we always hear that, eat better. But I bet if you Googled eat better, you're going to hear 40,000 different recommendations, right? What does that mean, eat better for blood pressure? What? Okay, so processed foods, because um, often those can be, uh, have a lot of sodium if it's processed meats, but then there's processed like um, wheat and things like that, which are simple carbs, which can raise your blood sugar. So processed foods, sodium, sodium, sodium. What else? Uh, no smoke. Well, smoking's important. We're gonna, interesting, I'm not covering smoking because everybody's got that one, right? We just can't do that. But as it comes to blood pressure with diet, um, sodium's important. And then uh, we want to eat more. Fruits and vegetables, right? Fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables. We'll talk about the DASH diet in just a second. So this is a chart, and I, I've been showing this a lot at the health fairs to remind people, because no one believes me when we say lifestyle actually can change your blood pressure a lot. This is from the national guidelines that were published in 2003, the old ones. If you lose weight, that's a lot of weight, but for every 20 pounds, you lose 5 to 20 points to your blood pressure. That's a lot, 20 points to your blood pressure, right? That's a lot. DASH diet we're going to talk about, but 8 to 14 points lower. We're going to talk about what the DASH diet is. Sodium reduction. How much sodium are we supposed to get a day? Anybody know? Mm. <laughs> Teaspoon? None. Um, the official, it depends on what guideline you look at. The American Heart Association says less than 1,500 milligrams a day. Other guidelines say less than 2.3 grams a day of, of sodium. Here's the thing about sodium. You don't, so what people say to me is, I don't add any salt. You don't have to add a thing, and you're going to be almost at or over that number. And that's because everything we eat has sodium. In the United States, what do you think is a thing where if you look at, out of all the things we eat, where we cumulatively get the most sodium in our diet, what do you think, what do you think it is? Any guesses? What, fast food? It's actually just the chips, canned goods. All those have a lot of sodium, but that's not actually where, we're, where we as Americans, it's bread. You know why? Because we eat so much bread. There's not that there's so much sodium, but they always add sodium. There's enough in, there's a little bit in there, and we eat so much bread. That's where we cumulatively get, what's that? And there's sugar in it too. But everybody's right. Things in a can always have a lot of salt, right? Processed foods always have a lot of salt. Um, we've heard about chips and pizza and things like that. Uh, but just even bread. And my point about bread was just to remind you that it's in every single thing we eat. That if you don't even add a, a, a smidge, you're still getting probably too much sodium right? If you're eating out or eating things that you buy that are processed from the stores, right? So you don't have to add a thing and you're still going to get too much. Um, physical activity, someone said that, four to 
10, and then reducing alcohol. Alcohol can be good for your heart, but if you drink a lot of it, and women, if you say what's heart healthy officially, one a day is heart healthy in women and men, it's one to two a day. Um, but if you have high blood pressure, you need to minimize alcohol because that can raise your blood pressure, okay? Um, all right, DASH diet, what is it? This is a study, so it's been studied. So a lot of things on the internet are, somebody said this, right? But we'll talk about things that have been studied, you know, in detail. This is a randomized trial, meaning half the people got this diet and half the people did a usual diet, okay? And they flipped a coin as to who was in what group. And it was uh, 500 people, and they had borderline to high blood pressure. What was the DASH diet? More fruits and vegetables, okay? Less saturated fat. We're gonna talk a lot about saturated fat in a little while. Um, they had a little bit more dairy, but when you did dairy, it's gotta be skim, low fat, low fat. You can't just, you know, so, so really low fat is important. We'll talk about that. Here's the important point, low sodium, and more potassium, so things like potassium, like apples, bananas, things like that. And what they found was that dropped your blood pressure. If you already had high blood pressure, dropped it by 12 points almost. Wow. That's it. Not a pill, right? And if you didn't have high blood pressure, dropped it by six points, which is not bad either. If you're at 130, you know, 132, 126 is better over your lifetime. That six points over your lifetime is a big deal, you know? So, so diet really, really matters, and, and DASH is the one that we focus on for high blood pressure. We'll talk about how these diets are more similar than they are different. All right, cholesterol. Ready to change gears? Anybody have any questions about blood pressure? You got it. We're going to lower our blood pressure. We know we got to eat better. And all the lifestyle things we can do, we're going to know what our blood pressure is. Yep, you have a question? How about water intake? Yeah, you know, water. So, so plain old water doesn't really affect your blood pressure. Because water, usually um, your body will, will regulate that. So it'll, you'll urinate it out. If you drink things with sodium in them, uh, you know, which turns a lot, but you have V8 or something that has sodium as well as fluid, then your blood pressure will go up. You know, when we use blood pressure medicines, when we say diuretics, they're not actually making, they're not, they have nothing to do with the water. What they do is they block the sodium resorption in the kidneys. So you're really urinating sodium and the water follows it. So water, you can drink as much water as you want. That will not adversely affect your blood pressure. Um, can have different issues in people that have congestive heart failure, weak hearts, but water by itself, no problem. Any other questions? That was a good question. All right, let's talk about cholesterol. So I wanna make sure we know the different things on a cholesterol panel because I get patients all the time and there's a lot of confusion, okay? So when you get a cholesterol panel from your doctor, everybody gets your cholesterol checked, right? At least once a year, right? Yes, yes, okay. All right, and if I asked around the room and said, what's your cholesterol, which I wouldn't do publicly, you'd know your number, right? Everybody knows it. All right, okay, she knows it. Um, all right, she's showing off over there about her cholesterol. You guys hear that? <laughs> all right, so your total cholesterol, when you get a blood test, it's gonna have four things in it. Okay? And people always get confused about which one is the one to tell your doctor the one we're concerned about. There's the total cholesterol. I'll come back to that in a second. The one you really want to focus on is the LDL. That's the bad one. We'll talk a lot about that today. There's the good cholesterol, which is the HDL. Okay? And then triglycerides are the fats, okay? which are akin to the fats in your blood. Um, here's the thing. The reason that we don't focus on total in the, in the you know, 60s and so, but we used to focus on total, so people still come in and want to talk about their total, and that's fine. The problem with the total is it is mathematically your bad cholesterol plus your good. I've had patients referred to me for high cholesterol because their good cholesterol is so high, right? And so the total looks high because their good is so high, right? Like you have a good of 85 and then your total is 210. People say, oh my God, my cholesterol is 210. But that's not the problem. Their LDL is actually fine, right? So, so LDL, LDL, LDL is what we mainly focus on here, okay? And just to tell you what are, what are good numbers, okay? Um, Ideally, every one of us would have an LDL under 100, ideally. Doesn't mean everybody needs a medicine to do that, but ideally. Maybe even closer to 70. There's a big debate about, well, how are those crazy doctors are trying to bring my cholesterol too low and I don't like it. And, but what do you, when you're born, what do you think your LDL cholesterol is? Well, not quite. <laughs> not as a human born, no. Um, maybe a plant, because there's no cholesterol. Uh, so it's usually 50 to 70, right? That's where that number comes from. If you look at, again, hunters and gatherers, people that don't have McDonald's that live in the forest somewhere, similar, 70s, 60s, right? And so we get confused by what is average in our population because we don't have a very healthy lifestyle, right? Um, but closer to 70. 100 to 129 is okay. Above 130 is getting to be borderline. Above 160 is high, okay? That's the LDL. So we'll talk a little bit about it. What do we do about someone's LDL cholesterol? And if people want to talk about triglycerides or HDL, I'm happy to as well. That's just a focus today that I want to speak about. Here's the quiz. Which of these, out of all these four, which of the two are the most important in determining what your LDL cholesterol is? How many people think it's your diet? You get to pick two. 
So some people think diets. What about weight? You think weight's important for cholesterol? We hear some people think for your LDL cholesterol. Exercise, think cholesterol if you don't exercise. Genetics, okay. Diet and genetics. I'm pretty clear. So you remember I'm an academic and I teach. So I'm very clear on my question. I said LDL cholesterol, okay. And I brought this up for a reason, because a lot of people, when they have high cholesterol, say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exercise and lose weight. You can do it all you want. It's not going to affect your cholesterol that much. Your LDL. It will affect the fats, the triglycerides. So let me say two things. Weight, weight loss and exercise are really important. Don't misunderstand me. But if you have really high cholesterol, and that's what you're fixated on, weight loss does not lower your LDL, your bad cholesterol. It does lower your triglycerides, the fats, and it can raise your good cholesterol. That is fair. Exercise maybe will lower your LDL by in, in certain studies by three, four points, which is not much, right? It does lower your triglycerides of fats. It does raise your good cholesterol. It is good for you. But if you have really high LDL, diet and genes. Remember, we can't do anything about our genes, right? So it's diet, 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 diet. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what, what diet, and then I'll kind of bring home diet in a second. All right, so there's two ways to look at this. We're really good as you know, healthcare telling you what not to do, okay? But I'm gonna tell you what you can do also. So you wanna avoid saturated fats and trans fats. There's a little bit of debate about cholesterol. Maybe I'll touch on that. But you really wanna avoid saturated fat and trans fats. What kind of things have saturated fat? Animal fats, right? So, you know, particularly, there, some have even more, like red meats would have more, but fatty, even turkey, you can get fatty turkey in the grocery store if you wanted, right? What else? Animal fats, I heard. Any? Butter. Has a lot of saturated fat. Eggs. Uh, eggs have a lot of cholesterol, but not a lot of saturated fat. We'll come back to that, because that's been the recent confusion area. Um, fast food, so fried foods, right? Desserts, anything? All the good stuff. I, that, you took the words out of my mouth, right? The good stuff, right? In some ways, that's a, um, the stuff we've been conditioned to eat, right? Um, now, so you really want to avoid those, and we'll talk about that. But I don't want to be just negative. There's actually things you can do to, to lower your cholesterol. Actively eating fiber, soluble fiber, bran. So you always hear about oatmeal, right? Bran. Uh, psyllium is like Metamucil. Good nuts. Um, so some nuts actually raise your cholesterol. The, the bad nuts are macadamia nuts and cashews. Those have a lot of saturated fat. Good nuts are almonds, walnuts, um, uh, uh, hazelnuts. Peanuts are okay as well. Um, but those are the better nuts, okay? And then beans and barley. I have a colleague sitting right back over there who eats a avocado a day. Can I share that with everybody right there? There you go. Raise the roof on that. So there was a recent big study that people, they randomized people to one avocado a day versus whatever else you ate. I mean, on top of your usual diet. People who ate the avocado lowered their cholesterol. And it's because it has a lot of fiber in it. And it also lowered their LDL. Because avocado has monounsaturated fats, which are the good fats, like, which we'll talk, I'll show you a slide in a second. But that's a good fats, like olive oil and things like that, that does not raise your LDL. So there are good fats and bad fats. I have that slide coming in one second. So hold that thought. But, but, but the point is that people get full, so they don't eat as much. It's good fat, so it doesn't raise your cholesterol. And um, the fiber makes you lose, lose, uh, lower your cholesterol. One catch is avocados have a lot of calories. So you always have to be careful, right, in what you're doing. OK, so, so just people got this. We said saturated fat, fatty meats, whole cheese, dairy. Forgot to mention that, but you know, not full fat milk, but skim. And I see a lot of patients that say, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm doing fine. But they're eating fried foods and whole cheese and dairy, and they can't understand why as a vegetarian their cholesterol is high. Yeah, I've seen the most unhealthy vegetarians ever. Yep. It has to do with how it digests. The soluble fiber, um, it, it stays in your gut. And so it kind of absorbs the cholesterol, and the cholesterol part, there's two ways it works, but one is it absorbs the cholesterol, and that passes out in your stool, and that's how it gets rid of some of the cholesterol and the saturated fat. And it does other things in your intestines, kind of does things on a molecular level to help lower your cholesterol levels. Um, but, but those are the types of things when we talk about soluble fiber. But uh, so, you know, oatmeal every morning would be good. Uh, if you think about different ways you can add fiber to your diet, that'll help lower your cholesterol. Yes, ma'am. So she, her question, I'm going to read a lot of She said, you know, there's an interest in ketogenic diets, and you could even, paleo is not the right word, but people are interested in what did the hunter and gatherers do? And you said there may have been predominant meat consumption, 
not as much fruits and vegetables. And so, you know, what, what is it? Mm-hmm. Well, I meant hunter gatherers in today's society, right? So I, I don't know what they were way back when. But my point is people who live kind of, you know, in, a, in r- real rural areas, not touched by, you know, mech whatever, right? And uh, I'm going to come back to that. That's a great question. You asked a great question. If you give me about five slides, if, and then I'm going to directly answer it, but I, I think I have some answers for you, all right? Hold that thought. But great point, because her question was also tied into low-carb, high-fat, which we'd be doing. I'm going to just summarize by saying one thing, and I'm going to get to this in a second. Whenever someone says, I want to do a diet, my second question is, for what? What is your goal? If your goal is weight loss, we might have a very different conversation than if your goal is for heart health. Those are two separate things. People always confuse those. Talking about Atkins, Zone, all that. Those are weight loss diets. No one ever called those heart health diets. And we assume that that's the same thing, but that's not necessarily. I'll come back, though. I had a great thought. I'm glad I'm, I'm on I'm on target here because I'm answering the questions you guys want. Um, so we, we kind of talked about this. Trans fats have stick, mar- or stick margarine, hydrogenated oils, a lot of anything that they can sit on the shelf for a long time, there's a reason for that, right? Um, they pumped it. So, you know, if you ever think of, like, Twinkies and Ding Dongs, those are things that have a lot of the trans fats because they've they can sit on the shelf for decades, right? All right. These are the list of fats and saturated fat. And if you start at the bottom, which has the most saturated fat? It's actually coconut oil. And I know coconut oil is all the rage. It is all the rage. Um, I, was at, I was at my grocery store the other day. I took a picture for a talk I have to give. And the coconut oil thing was like, this whole area was coconut oil. <laughs> Let me talk about that for a second. I think there's many, re- back to my point, if it's heart health, my wife puts it on her hair. If you want to use your hair, great. Some people may say it's brain healthy. Fine. If you're asking me, is it a heart healthy, heart healthy component? I do not think it is, and I'll tell you why. And, and one of my our colleagues, Joanne, um, uh, Joanne Carson's a nutritionist here. We both had to give a talk at the American Heart Association. This was her talk about what's the evidence to date. Here's what happens with coconut oil, and this has been shown in small feeding studies where they feed people coconut oil or not. This is why people think it's good. It does raise your good cholesterol, but it also raises your LDL, your bad cholesterol. Which one's worse, right? Which one's better? I will tell you, the HDL, as much as people are excited about it, one of my, we do research here. One of my colleagues did a wonderful study that was published in, you know, in the New England Journal of Medicine, the best journal in, in medicine, which showed that the number, of, the number which your HDL doesn't actually tell you as much as its function. What the HDL does, the good cholesterol, goes and pulls cholesterol out of your tissues and brings it back to the liver, okay? And, for example, there's people who live in Italy who have an HDL about 25, and they live in their 90s, because their HDL is real efficient. It picks up cholesterol, throws it to the liver, and then disappears, and then you make some more, and it goes real fast, okay? And then I've seen people, and there's data, where people have, I have a person in my clinic whose good cholesterol is 220. Normal's above 40, right? So it's ridiculously high, and everybody has heart disease in their family. It's because it just sits around and doesn't do anything, and they have genetic problems as well. So fixation on HDL is probably not the best thing, and that's what I think some people are saying coconut's heart healthy. It definitely raises your LDL cholesterol. And we've seen it in our clinic over and over again. People, their cholesterol goes up, and we can't figure out why my nutritionist probes them and finds out they've been doing coconut oil, right? Um, butter, palm oil, lard, all these have a decent amount of saturated fat. The good oils, canola oil, uh, olive oil, even sunflower, corn oil, these ones have less saturated fat, okay? So those, if you're trying to work on your cholesterol, those would be better choices, all right? All right, I'm gonna, this woman had a, a great question. Has anybody ever seen this game, Whack-A-Mole? Anybody played Whack-A-Mole? So, like, you, you hit something and something else pops up, right? All right, so in the 60s, everybody said saturated fat. Don't do it. Cut out saturated fat. And so we whacked it. Then what, what popped up? And what, so, so high fructose corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, soda, simple sugar, simple carbs, simple carbs, simple carbs, simple carbs, right? We got carb, and not just any carbs, but simple carbs, so which exactly what I just said. I mean, if you look at a package, someone said, even our, you know, it, it, about, about sugar, it has 20 different names, high fructose corn syrup, uh, sucrose, you can go on and on. They name it 20 different things, it's all sugar, and it's processed, right? And so what happened over the years is people told us not to eat saturated fat, so everybody ate a lot of simple carbs, and that trade-off, and then there was an article, which you may have seen a few weeks ago or months ago, widely publicized. People told us to stop eating saturated fats, and if you look at the evidence, that doesn't lower heart attack risk. I have a slide at the end, if I have time, I'll show you. When people have looked at this, if you don't eat saturated fat and you replace that with something healthy, complex carbohydrates, good fats, protein, you lower your heart disease risk. If you stop eating saturated fat, you replace it with something unhealthy, you know what's going to happen. It's not going to help you. 
right? And I, I have a slide I can show you at the end. So, so that's the, the take home on that. Let me bring home diet, the last two things about diet, and hopefully I'll cover this, this uh, woman's question. You say, what diet has the best evidence, not anecdote, evidence that it lowers the risk of heart attacks and strokes? That's the Mediterranean diet. I'm going to show you that study in just a second. Now, what does the Mediterranean diet include? This is not the current U.S. pyramid. They don't even really have a pyramid. But in the U.S., we eat a lot of breads and a lot of, a lot of carbs, and many of them are simple carbs, right? Remember my mantra, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? Remember that. So you want to avoid that. And we do a lot of that here, white rice, white pasta, white. We eat some fruits and vegetables, probably not enough. We eat a lot of dairy. We eat a lot of meat, right? And fats and sweets and oils. What the Mediterranean diet is, is a lot less carbs. And when they do, they're complex carbs, whole grains, right? Different, different whole grains that people are eating. Lots of fruits and vegetables, including beans and legumes, beans and legumes. Good oils, olive oil, not much dairy, but a little bit, fish, good, fi and then lean meats, and then very little red meats and sweets, okay? That's the Mediterranean diet. Here is the evidence. Listen, anything you, everybody can say, my diet says, show me the evidence, right? 7,000 people, uh, 7,000 people who were at risk for heart disease, okay? Half of them just kept eating what they got, and half of them were randomized and given a dietary plan for the Mediterranean diet. So one interesting thing, there were two parts to that. Of these people that got the Mediterranean diet, half got, they gave them olive oil, and they gave them one liter of olive oil a week. Got a liter a week of olive oil. There's a lot of olive oil, right? And the other group was a nuts group, so everything else was the same, the, the whole grains and beans and things like that. But this group was given, instead of olive oil, they got nuts, walnuts, hazelnuts, and almonds, okay? And these two groups had a 30% lower risk of heart attacks and strokes. 7,000 people say 30% lower, not anecdote, I heard this once, right? And again, this is a heart-healthy diet. I didn't even mention weight loss. I didn't mention anything. On a side note, they've since published in this group, there's actually less cognitive decline and less breast cancer risk with this same diet in this group. Um, so evidence, right? So let me bring it together and try to touch on this latest point. Go ahead, yeah. Well, it's a good question. I'm not sure they did. They were given a liter a week, okay? And they were told to lavishly spread it on what you eat. So on their, on their salad, they probably put some olive oil. They cooked with it. They, you know, so different things. I don't think they were drinking it, you know? But, and, 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 yeah, and I'm not sure they actually physically consumed that full liter, right? But this is what they were given to use it liberally is the bottom line, to liberally use the olive oil, all right? Um, okay. So let me say, when, when there's a lot of controversy about diets, because you hear so much information, I, I'm kind of a, a divider or a uniter. I'm a uniter, right? They all have more in common than they have different. Except for one thing, we'll talk about ketogenic in a second. DASH diet we talked about, low-fat diet, Mediterranean, therapeutic lifestyle. There's a couple guys named Ornish and Esselstyn, if people are interested, that do very low-fat diets. They all are saying this, there's, this is, they're all saying the same thing, increased fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, increased fiber, less saturated fat. Okay. Now, can we debate about, um, can I have some saturated fat or no fat whatsoever? Can I, you know, and back to your point, I don't know what to tell you about that because there's even debate where people have actually, there's a study recently where they looked in teeth of ancestors and actually looked at their stool samples. There is vegetable and fruit matter in there, so we don't know that they, that's all they ate, you know, and, and meat consumption for me and you, which I can just go buy Kroger on the way home and get what I want versus... You kill one animal every week, you know, and you eat just a little bit and you try to survive. It's just a very different pattern, you know. Um, my point is this. The, the low-carb diet and high fat, I actually don't have a problem with it except on what kind of fat you're eating, you know. And if it's the people that go gangbusters and do a bunch of saturated fat, that's probably not a good plan. Um, if you were a little bit more careful and were doing healthy fats like our colleague in the back with the avocado or things, that may be okay. Um, so it's not, and I just want to always remember the whack-a-mole. Stop one thing, and this is why just focus on a healthy pattern of eating, right? Rather than one thing that we whack a mole, right? Because that, that's never, that's not going to do it because something else will pop up, right? Okay, we're going to finish talking about blood sugar and exercise. And um, uh, what's a normal blood sugar? Anybody know? So 60 is fair if you're, if you're like in the hospital, but, you know, what point if you just went to your doctor's office is that, oh, that's a little bit abnormal? Yeah, under 100 is normal. Very good, right? Very good. So your fasting glucose under 100 is normal in terms of saying, and if you're between 120, 125, there's a fancy name, impaired fasting glucose, or we call that prediabetes, okay? And 126 or greater is diabetes. There's another test you can use. It's a 
called an A1C. It checks your blood sugar over the last two to three months. Less than 5.7 is normal. Above 6.5 is diabetes. I really want you to know this number because prediabetes is pretty common. It affects something like you know, 20 to 30% of the population because it tracks with obesity. And I can't tell how many people I see that don't know that they have prediabetes because their doctor says your numbers are fine. Usually when your numbers are here, people say, oh, they're fine. Because they're not horrible, then they must be fine, right? But that's not what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get them perfect. So make sure you know what your numbers are. Your glucose should be under 100. If it's borderline, we're going to talk about what that means over your lifetime, right? What does that mean for you, and what do we do about it? So here's the thing, like, what is it that's driving the diabetes epidemic in the United States, right? And it's really weight. And this is the risk of diabetes. If you're normal weight, let's call that the reference group. If you're overweight, it's about 1.60% higher. If you're obese between 30 and 39, it's almost four times higher. And if you're really obese, about 40 is your BMI, about nine times higher risk of diabetes, okay? So weight and blood sugar are gonna go hand in hand, right? Hand in hand. Plus, some people are predisposed genetically towards diabetes. And if you take those people and then you throw weight on top of it, then they're really gonna get in trouble, right? So this is my favorite study to quote. I quote it all the time in my clinic because it's, it really is meaningful. So this study took people and said, well, so first let me say, when you have borderline blood sugars, prediabetes, um, it does increase your risk of heart disease, not as much as you think. It's 1.3 times, about 30% higher. But you have a three to five times higher risk of developing diabetes over your lifetime, 300 to 500% higher, right? So if you have prediabetes, heart disease is important, but you really gotta watch out for developing diabetes, and then when you develop diabetes, then heart disease risk really goes up, okay? And so the DPP trial took, um, took a, a, a large number of people who had had um, borderline blood sugars, prediabetes. A third of them, they said, keep doing what you're doing. A third of them, they gave them a drug called metformin that lowers blood sugar. And a third of them, they said, lose weight and exercise, okay? And, but they're very specific. I think they lost about five kilograms, 10 pounds, which is decent. And they were exercising, you know, which we'll talk about exercise recommendations. Compared to the people who just did what they did, this is the development of diabetes over about three years. If you took the drug, you had about a third lower risk. If you lost weight and exercise, you had about a 60% lower risk of diabetes. 60% lower. So, when you, so if you see that, right, if you see that number of my blood sugar's borderline, weight loss and exercise make a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to prevent diabetes over your lifetime, right? So really, really important to know that number because if you start seeing that, that might encourage you more about things you need to do. All right, we talked about diet, but remember way back when, we're not, you know, uh, somebody knew this a long time ago. Hippocrates in the fifth century said, eating alone will not keep a man well. You must also take exercise, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about exercise. How much ex aerobic exercise is a recommendation minimum that everyone should get a week? Oh, you got it, you got it, I heard something. Okay, so 30 minutes a day, uh, average to be about right. She said three times a week. It depends, but, but you're on the right track. The official recommendation is this. This is from the physical activity guidelines. Now, let me be, make sure you understand what moderate and vigorous intensity. Moderate intensity is like, like brisk walking or, you know, brisk walking. And that should be 150 minutes a week, which is like 30 minutes a week, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, okay? Now, um, a couple of tr tricks about exercise just to teach you. That doesn't mean it could be 60 minutes one day, none the next day, and 60 the next. The guidelines say it can be cumulative, right? So there's no magic to 30 minutes straight. I say that because I have say I only have 20 minutes, or my legs hurt after 15. Well, then do 15, and then later in the day, do another 15, right? It doesn't all have to be done at once. It does not all have to be done at once. It's cumulative, okay? Now, if you do vigorous intensity like jogging, uh, you know, jogging or things like that, they're a little more vigorous, or, or biking on a, a bike that you're going a little bit faster, um, 75 minutes a week, which is roughly like 25 minutes, three times a week, okay? Um, these are, by the way, this is minimum. I didn't say you can't do more, right? But that's the minimum recommendation for every U.S. adult. On a side note, everyone's supposed to do a, a resistance exercise two days a week, like some sort of resistance exercise. Build some muscle mass, because as we get older, we, we, we lose that. Now, one thing I want to teach you, like a subtlety about this, people always ask this. Um, you know, I have someone who never exercised and be like, should I go and run a marathon tomorrow, right? The answer is no. Um, but let me tell you why. It turns out this is, um, this is chance of dying, okay? And this is, uh, uh, um, th sorry, this is the, the uh, uh, relative risk reduction. So how much are we reducing your risk? If you're doing nothing, these are people doing very little, and these are people making about 150 minutes a week. You can see by doing nothing to just meeting our guidelines, we get a lot of benefit. Well, we have about a 30% reduction, roughly, in the chance of, of, dying, uh, of, of dying, okay? 
When you go from doing 150 minutes a week up to 300, as I would say, if you go from couch potato to doing something, you get a lot of benefit. Something to Lance Armstrong, it starts to flatten off a little bit, okay? See how that flattens off a little bit, the benefit? I'm not telling you you shouldn't do more, right? But don't make perfect the enemy of good, right? So don't say, well, if I can't do this, then I'm not going to do anything. That's not true. Even a little bit matters, okay? Because I hear that all the time. You know, I can't do that much, then I'm not going to do anything, right? So, so I just want to make you understand that even doing a little is where you get most of your benefit, and then fine-tuning after that, at least in terms of heart attacks and overall death. Okay, here's my tips for exercise for you today. First, anybody use a pedometer or track their steps? Here you see, it looks like you do. Um, so others do. Remember, all our phones, almost every phone nowadays, the smartphones have a pedometer in it. Surgeon General says we should get 10,000 steps a day. How many steps is a mile? You know, 2,000 steps is a mile. So that'd be about five miles a day. What I usually say is just start tracking for a few days and see what you get on average. If you average three or 4,000, say next week I'm going to try to increase it by 500 steps a day. And then each week try to build up over time, you know, see what you're getting on average. But I don't, not just because I say this, this has been shown in randomized trials, giving people a dominant or not, this helps with weight loss and losing weight circumference and increasing physical activity. There's something about us being accountable, you know. Um, do something you like. People always say, what should I do? Should I, should I run? Should I, I say, what do you like to do? Because the ultimate thing is this has to be, a, this is not a fad, this is lifelong. So decide what is it you, I always start with, what did you, what did you do growing up? What did you like? Oh, you know, I really love to swim. And I look at them, and they're like, wow, I don't know why I don't swim anymore, you know? And they have to just think about what is it you enjoy, right? Because we can fine-tune about should it be rowing or biking, and that's fine-tuning. But the first thing is just do something you like so you can sustain it. Find a friend, because if you have a friend, you're more likely to do it because you find someone to do it with. Set a schedule. So I always tell people, if it's like, an, well, I'm going to try to do two days a week, but you have no plan, not going to happen, right? Because there's a million other things you could do that are going to come up. So you've got to say every Tuesday and Thursday at this time is when I exercise, right? Every Tuesday morning and Thursday at this time or afternoon. So you've got to sit down and think morning, afternoon, lunchtime, what works with your family life schedule, set a schedule. 30 minutes, I already said this, but it doesn't have to all be at once. It can be 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, especially people that have orthopedic issues that can't do 30 minutes straight. Um, I always like to, and they, they find that to be important to know that. Um, and everything counts. It's cumulative. So even though you go to the gym, if you park further away, if coming over here from POB1, you took this, walked it rather than taking the, the bus, all of that adds up in terms of cardiovascular health, right? All of it matters. If you, on your lunch break, decide to take a couple laps around Gooch, that counts too, right? All right. Finally, I'll just talk about two other things. For everything I told you is appropriate for 90% of people. If you do all those things, you're good, okay? There are some people where it's just not going to be quite enough, and I'll just spend one second on that. If you have a really strong family history of heart disease, um, I saw someone earlier today where all, you know, father, all the fathers, siblings, everyone was dying in their 50s from heart attacks. If that's the case, you're, you might need a little bit more than that. That may not be enough, okay? And don't ignore that if you have a strong family history, first few relatives, parents, and uh, siblings. So this is a study we did in the Dallas Heart Study, just to give you an example of this. A few years ago, we published this, where we took about 2,400 people. In the Dallas Heart Study, we've done these scans in everybody. It's called a calcium scan. We scan their heart, and this white stuff is calcium. Couldn't care less about the calcium, but if you have calcium, you have cholesterol buildup in your arteries, okay? And so we said, what proportion of people have cholesterol buildup in their arteries? In young women, um, without a family history, only about 5% did. But if they had a family history of heart disease, about 15% did, so three times higher. Um, build up in their arteries if they had just having a family history. In men, 15% versus 24%. Notice, if you're a woman with a family history, you suddenly became a man, right? And women usually have less heart disease than men. So if you have a family history, you can't ignore it. And then we have to talk about sometimes you'll need additional tests or sometimes we need to be a little more aggressive with your numbers, but that's on an individual level. In our preventive cardiology program, we see a lot of patients like this to help figure out what they need to do. Okay, UT has a lot of resources. The reason we are here, not just, yes, yes, yes. Very good point. Yeah. Fair point. That's a great point. You know, half of the time what you inherit is sometimes just shared environment, you know, smoking and things like that. And I'd say to you, this is where it gets subtle, and you don't have to say this publicly, but, you know, if they, so, so if someone's a smoker and diabetic and they had a heart attack, is that surprising? We're saying, is that surprising, you know? Is something genetic, or is it just what we'd expect? And the, the subtlety there is sometimes the age. 
So like I saw a woman yesterday who asked the same question because her mother smoked, but her mother had a heart attack at 45. That's still pretty unusual, even in smokers, you know, versus 70, then that's not quite as unusual, you know? And also you look at the full family tree, you have to extend it, all the siblings, everyone else, you know? So sometimes there's a subtlety in trying to tease out the family history. I think you have a good point though about what if the person had a lot of risk factors. Sometimes what we'll do in our clinic, we'll have you get their, your parents' cholesterol records, you know, and your parents test to look at them to try to sort out better. Um, okay. UT, yes, 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 yeah. Um, back to the study, uh, what did you find in this study? Yeah, in this study, we did under men under 50 and women, un, men under 50 and women under 50. For this, there was a reason why we did that, but that's what we did in this study. And they were between 30 and 50 was their age. But having said that, though, even at 20, that family history is still with you, right? And even if this test would not have shown us anything because you were too young, it's brewing. And if you have a strong family history, young in life, you can start making good lifestyle choices, right? To at least start to bend that curve a little bit so you don't end up on that, on that pathway, you know? Um, so we're here today because we're here to take care of our own health. And UT has done a lot for that. If you don't know this already, if you go to the internet under HR and benefits and wellness, there's this whole site and they have, uh, you know, campus-wide walking trail maps under blood pressure, where there's blood pressure locations, just lots of things that the university is doing and resources for you in terms of how to improve your health while you're at work or even when you're not at work. Um, I hope, I don't know if anybody's ever downloaded this campus walking map. My nutritionist Susan started this project years ago and taken over by HR, but these are great, right? It tells you, like, how far you're walking and has it all mapped out for you. And so really try to download that because we all have a little bit of downtime here and there, lunch or breaks, and we can use them wisely if we don't have a lot of time when we get home. Okay, I'm going to finish by saying take care of yourself. Make sure you know your own numbers. Make a plan for your health. This isn't going to go away. you got to actually address this. Take it head on, right? And for your family's health. Don't make a quick fix. That's not what we're trying to do here, right? We're, we're not trying to do a fad. We're trying to change your life and your families for, for eternity. Doing a little bit early on is better than waiting till you're 70 and deciding you're going to take care of it then, right? Start early. Uh, finally, if you don't listen to anything I say, you may get one of these, wow, $50 off an angioplasty. Maybe they'd have that at one of the places around. Right okay, happy to take any questions. Do they have any questions? Thank you, I appreciate it. His, his question is related to sleep. I know we're almost out of time. I'll just say uh, two things about sleep. One is people that have sleep apnea where that, that don't breathe well at night. They have a slightly increased risk of heart disease. Maybe because when you're not breathing, your blood pressure is high, so they get hypertension and insulin resistance. Um, there is also people that have abnormal sleep patterns that have a higher risk of heart disease. But that, that may be shared company. They have more stress or other things, not necessarily the sleep itself. But the biggest one is probably sleep apnea and sleep patterns. He wants me to pull out of this. All right, here comes the big winner before everybody disappears. <laughs> Close my eyes, just note, so I don't have any personal uh, biases here. And, oh, I got, I didn't even look at the other one. Elizabeth, 57267 Clinical Heart Center. She was here and she just left. We can do another one. I have a, you have an so, extra? Yeah, I have another one. So she get one or she doesn't get one? She yeah, can. she'll get that one. I'll just do another one. Gaurav Pudyal, right there. There's our man. Thank you all for coming. You can come up and ask me questions uh, so I can let people go, but feel free to come up and ask any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your time.